I recently picked this up. It's a sickle and it has a clover on it. No wording, but a clover. A lot of people online don't know where these come from, but I was able to find it. I looked up Sears and Roebuck catalogs and the 1913 catalog didn't have this, but the 1922 catalog did. And so it looks like this was a sickle sold, a quite high quality sickle sold from the late 1910s to probably the 1930s. Several variations of them. And another one looked older that had Big Indian stamped on it. So whatever company made that, that's another lead. But couldn't figure out who makes who, who exactly makes it. But they were sold by Sears. And what I'm going to be using this for is gardening. I really enjoy an old keen cut scythe that I restored years ago because it works really wonderful for cleaning up a forest. And since I'm hoping to do some work on the parks around here, I wanted to get a scythe, but I couldn't find a scythe in any, any of the antique shops. I did find a bunch of these though, and most of them were the lower quality, thin stamped metal that my family had. Because you know, like my, my great grandfather, he left me with a bunch of uh, sickles and they were just the lower quality ones. They almost looked homemade, honestly. And we didn't really, obviously, we couldn't afford these back in the early 1900s. But it's a bit, it's a bit fancy feeling because I always kind of brushed them off because they, they didn't really last too long. But then I saw this one and the quality does remind me more of my Keen Cut Scythe. And it's like, you know what? Maybe I can use this after all. I can lower my expectations and restore this since it's only $8.00. And maybe it'll be a bit more like my scythe that I restored. And if it really works, I could even make an extended handle. That way I can go around and I don't have to lean over to cut them. Because what this will be really good for is there's a local invasive species in the, this area of Pennsylvania that I would like to try to cut back. It's almost like a, a, a type of grass, but it's really thick. And so it'd be really great for this to cut it. Original paint was red, of course. Made of stamped steel. I think it's hardened steel as well. So it's the original color. We have a steel grommet on top of this wood. I think it was actually repainted at some point. The fact that this comes apart will make it really easy to sharpen and really easy to put back together. Fun side note, I actually saw somebody on eBay was selling one where they put it together that way and they actually had like it bent the blade. I don't know why they put it together wrong but it's always how it goes with this old stuff. You never know how you're going to find it. Now I do notice that the paint didn't go down here. Normally with these, I paint the whole thing and then I grind away just the edge just because it's more protective. But perhaps I should put some black paint there. We'll see. Now first I think we should give some affection towards the little heroes of the tool, the nuts and bolts. I'll clean those up first. I had no idea one of those was brass. Wasn't I just saying something about how all this old farm equipment has so many unexpected twists in it? Now we should clean this up.
So now before we paint, if, if we get it down to the shiny metal and then we just wipe it off with some acetone, we won't need any primer. This protective enamel will be just fine. But you just have to make sure you have a really, really pristine surface. I'm using the acetone because it's, it's not going to rust it. It's not like water or anything. Oops. Oh well, a bit of a lost cause. Just like that. And now I've, I've normally always painted these an orangish red, you know, because it's like danger. The, um, I should fix that before I paint it. It's a, it's a sharp blade, so I want it to be red. But I finally got some Gloss Hunter Green Rust-Oleum Protective Enamel, and I really want to use that. And then my friend Rick has some Gloss Almond, and I thought, wouldn't that be interesting? They did sell these in green. So why don't I, I paint this green and this almond and maybe paint that black? But that'd be interesting. And right. If I want to add this gap on there, it is seven eighths. A little bit under seven eighths, and then three quarters. So it goes from seven eighths to three quarters. So if and if anybody else wants to repaint that, because it's interesting, you can actually see where the paint was just from how it oxidized, or actually, shall I say, where the paint wasn't. Now I don't trust myself to just oil this enough, so I am going to be painting it. I have to find the paintbrush, but before I do that, I'm going to mix these up, and then let them sit for a minute. That way all the paint drips off of the top. And it's even better if you can store them at an angle. That way you don't open it up and paint goes all over your hands. Like so. So that'll save me a lot of work later. That looks like that's actually the color of the wood a bit, but I don't think I'm going to stain it because this seems like it's honestly a soft wood. They were building this down to a price after all. And so I think some linseed oil will be really good for that. Okay, so first do the grain. Get a little piece of wire and make your best stir stick you'll ever have. Now I have another piece of baling wire and whenever I actually start painting, I hope to... Yeah, okay, that'll work. And it'll, it'll, it'll hang that really well. I started storing my brushes in acetone. It makes them last a lot longer. All right. Where's the hammer? Oh no. Last minute repairs that I forgot about.
the paint's too cold. If it was warmer, it would help a lot. Ah, we have a heater. Let's see if it's still plugged in. It's not, no. I should, you should never go back and try to fix runs, but I'm, I do it every time. Well, yeah, this paint's way too cold. My brush is just too coarse. And there, there's, again, there's that, that issue of the, the flex of stuff in there. This paint is really difficult to use. Really, really difficult. It, it requires like a, a special touch, honestly. I'm getting all sorts of paint flex, little globules of paint. And... Yeah. They're part of the brush, it's part of the issues of reusing paint brushes, really. At least with this part of paint, type of paint. It's doing better with this one. I just have to go so very light because this, these bristles are too thick. It's a lot better. And almost no specks. I'm gonna hang it like that. We'll see what happens. Now most of the magic happens in the 20 minutes of drying. And if it weren't for all those specks on there, it would this would have been fine. It was just warm enough. Now this one is definitely um, smoothing up quite well, but but yeah. I'll leave it though. I'll leave it. I should. Time for a little bit of gloss black, which is the last little bit I'll put on the handle. I heated this up a lot, but the black pigment has the smallest size, so there's more paint, uh, more oil for each piece of pigment. And so the black 
smooths out really well. So I'm not gonna have hardly any issues, most likely. Oh yeah, heating up this paint is amazing. Look at that, it just it just goes right on. The black is the easiest. Going from high difficulty to low difficulty, it's always astonishing, to be honest. So if I wanted this to work better, I'll have to do it in summer. And I'll set these outside and get them up to about 130 or 120 degrees. That's what I found it takes to get a mirror finish on that. It also doesn't hurt that I've been getting very good at the black lately because I've been using it to paint these, which are the window frames to stained glass going into a church for restoration. I should have heated these up more. In a future video, you may see that I'll get one of those heating elements that's designed to put your tea on and it keeps it up to like 110 120 degrees i think that would be perfect i turn it on and let it heat up for an hour or so and then i have nice hot paint and the hot paint then has like the lower viscosity so when you brush it on the the furrows left behind by the the hairs of the brush melt together really quickly and you get that nice smooth surface i had to do something akin to that when I was painting with red pigment, because the red, just like the lighter colors, the pigment has to be very big, and so it, does, it doesn't smooth out as fast. It's been two days now. It gave us some extra time. And although I'm not happy with it, I am happy with it. You know, the, um, all the specks, because I didn't clean the paint brush well enough, they will bug me, but here's the thing. It's a piece of, like, farm equipment, so I can't go too crazy over it. I'm going to be using this to clean up the forest in a park, and so I need to uh, go with it, and then... Next year, if I wear off the paint from all the use, I can try painting it again. I was hoping this would be a little browner, but you know what? It's not too bad. And that's pretty good. I'm happy with that. So this blade I probably should do it by hand, but it's never been sharpened before. And I think I don't need to sharpen it too much. I went crazy with my hands, with my big scythe, my 24 inch scythe. And I spent weeks hand filing it and I got into a good place. But with this, I think I can just run it over this and it should be fine.
protective stuff is good, but some, sometimes it can get in the way, but eh, I still did it okay. This wouldn't be enough to do grass with a scythe, but this will be enough to do weeds with a sickle. Almost sounds like a parable that I just made up, but uh, yeah. And that's that. So, yeah, you can definitely tell that it's not nearly as sharp as my scythe because if I had the blade resting on my finger like that and it was my scythe, uh, I would not have a finger anymore. So this is definitely, it's sharp, but not super dangerous. And you know what? That's probably better because I got that scythe so sharp that I could actually, I could cut just regular old grass with it. And it was a bit of a, it felt dangerous. It felt really dangerous to hold it because anything it touched, it would just cut into it. So this is a, this is a good, a good sharpness where it's, I can even run my finger along it like that, and it it doesn't feel like it. Yeah, it's, it's not going to cut into my finger. But I'm sure that if I hit a weed with it, it'll be fine. Look at that! I'm quite chuffed. Time to test out the sickle. Oh, it works wonderfully for this. So normally you have to grab it and cut it like that. But with this, It's a little bit of poison ivy over there. I'll have to wash my, I'll have to wash my sickle now. But oh well. This is working out really well. Not so much on the thin stuff, but like it can come through here and it won't cut the grass, but it will kill the weeds. Of course, there's not much use in doing this now since this is all going to die for the year, but in springtime, it will be more useful. Yeah, that's like a weed. But it works really well for this. I was hoping to not use this on poison ivy though, but I go like a few seconds and I'm already cutting down poison ivy. Back there, I mean, not here. This is, yeah, there's no poison ivy here. So adding a, a long handle to it. Well, let's see. OK, 
Okay, this is a, a rare instance, a particularly thick one, but if I go like this, see, with, with it in my hand, I can swing it around really easily and I can cut stuff. But if I connect it to a longer handle, I'll want to do like, like that kind of motion. So, with just about 15 minutes of work, I've cleared away a bunch of space and had a surprising realization. I did not realize where I was. There's that frame from the old weir that used to be here. I didn't realize I was right here. I didn't even recognize this spot because of all the weeds. Uh, I think the camera works better. So yeah, this works pretty well. There was no poison ivy over here, but there was in the other spot. So I'm going to wash up the uh, sickle and then that's pretty much it. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and thank you very much for watching. See ya.